Tonight, high alert. Communities in Alberta race to prepare for hot and dry conditions that could fuel more wildfires. New evacuation warnings after a brief period of relief. We remain in an extremely volatile situation. As smoky skies wreak havoc on highways. It was scary because we could hear crashes behind us. The push to search a Manitoba landfill for the remains of two Indigenous women. It breaks my heart that I don't have a grave to take my niece and nephew to. The challenges ahead and the cost of not acting. You cannot put a price on the lives of First Nation women. Plus, an historic tip-off. These are the things that are going to build the dreams and the goals of the next generation. The WNBA takes the court in Canada for the first time in history. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Heather Wright. Good evening, crews in Alberta are racing against time to get a foothold against the wildfires before a wave of hot, dry weather rolls into the province this weekend. There are currently almost 80 fires burning, most of them in central and northern Alberta. About 20 are considered out of control. And as CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, the smoke from those fires is creating a whole new hazard. Thick wildfire smoke near Edmonton contributed to this massive pileup this morning. 34 vehicles and 14 injuries. Two were taken to hospital in critical condition. Pretty stressful way to actually start out a Friday, but luckily we were able to walk out of it. Evacuated Drayton Valley residents also began the day with more stress, learning they won't be home for at least another week. I don't think anybody really was expecting that long. It's frustrating because we, we, we don't know where we're going to be. We don't know where we're going to stay. Already as many as six homes have been lost and the fight to save the town of 7,000 is far from over. There's a credible risk to the town of Drayton Valley and we are doing everything we can. The weather is going to test us over the next coming days. As hot, dry conditions set in here and across the province, crews are digging in their heels, scrambling to stamp out hot spots and build fire breaks the last line of defense for communities against nature's fury. Our teams on the ground have been working hard to prepare for more challenging conditions. Already this wildfire season is being called unprecedented and with the worsening conditions comes a warning, more evacuations are likely. I urge you to pack important medication and documents and enough food and supplies for a minimum of seven days. The town of Whitecourt is already temporary home to hundreds of evacuees. We feel like we are with the family. Like we have a like, you know, really safe, safe. The community now preparing to welcome more. I'm glad that we can do that. Like I'm glad that we all just 100% work together and make this happen. When it comes to this firefight, this weekend is pivotal. If crews can keep the flames from entering town in these hot, dry conditions, officials expect to have a better timeline on re-entry plans by early next week. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Drayton Valley, Alberta. In Manitoba tonight, the families of two Indigenous women believed to be murdered and buried in a landfill are one step closer to recovering their remains. A study has found that a search of the landfill would be difficult but feasible. CTV's Judy Trin reports. The remains of at least two Indigenous women may be here. Their bodies discarded at the Prairie Green landfill after they were allegedly murdered by a serial killer. The search was deemed not feasible until a study commissioned by the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs showed it could be done. You cannot put a price on the lives of First Nation women or the horrific and profound loss their families have experienced. The study found searching for Morgan Harris and Mercedes Ryan could take up to three years and cost $184 million. There's also a risk of encountering toxic waste and asbestos, but the cost to the victims' families would be greater if the search was not done. This feasibility study is 55 pages long and as it should be, but no amount of words on paper can give you enough reasons as to why you should search for our woman. It all began last summer when the remains of Rebecca Contoy were found at another landfill. 
An investigation led to Jeremy Skibicki, who was accused of killing the three women last spring and an unidentified victim known only as Buffalo Woman. It breaks my heart that I don't have a grave to take my niece and nephew to this Mother's Day. Um, it's really hard to tell them. Today, the federal government said it would initiate meetings with Manitoba and the city of Winnipeg to start the process. As the Assembly of Manitoba chief said, uh, what signal do you send if, uh, if you don't search for uh, First Nations bodies that have been disposed uh, as if they were trash, which they are absolutely not, and they are sacred and they are to be honoured. There are no guarantees the women's remains will be found, and the healing of the community will also depend on the outcome of Jeremy Skibicki's trial. That trial is still a year away. Heather. CTV's Judy Trin in Ottawa. And as you saw in Judy's report, Mark Miller was in northern Newfoundland and Labrador today, where he joined Justin Trudeau for a series of critical meetings with Inuit leaders. This was said to be the first visit by a sitting prime minister to the Inuit region of Labrador, where one of the key issues is housing. We know the needs are significant, but we also know uh, there are opportunities to create jobs, to create sustainable uh, approaches to housing that are going to make a huge difference. Across Canada, half the people living in major Inuit regions live in overcrowded homes, while a quarter live in houses in need of major repairs. The Prime Minister was also asked about foreign interference from China today and whether his government acted quickly enough. Tonight, CTV News can confirm expelled Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei has officially left Canada. He was accused of targeting the family of Conservative MP Michael Chong. A man from the small village of Bourget, Ontario, is in custody tonight, charged with first-degree murder in the death of a police officer. Today, a neighbour of the accused spoke to CTV News about what she saw at the property next door. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. Investigators continue to scour the crime scene, where a police officer was shot and killed yesterday. It was a very quick event. It was very... It was very intense, it was very scary. Just through those trees, Jennifer Maynard heard the gunfire. It was a, a couple of different times of multiple shots. So gunshots, yelling direction, and then more gunshots. The Ontario Provincial Police say three officers were ambushed. Sergeant Eric Mueller, a father of two young children, was killed. Nobody should be harmed like that in their life. Nobody should have to get that phone call that their loved one is not coming home. I'm having a hard time. Sergeant Mueller's detachment is devastated as well. His colleagues are remembering the respected 21-year veteran and are also concerned for the two others injured. One was treated and released and is recovering at home, and thankfully. And, and the other uh, remains in hospital, is still being treated for the, the very serious injuries that he suffered in this shooting. The tragedy has shaken the village of Bourget. Everybody's nervous, uh, saddened. Uh, you know, how do we thank those police officers that do this every day? Around 1,100 live here, but most can't place Alain Bellefeuille, the man accused of killing a cop. Is that strange for a town this size? That is actually really strange. Everyone knows everyone here pretty much. I guess he was a loner and didn't go out much. The OPP is revealing few details about the progress of the investigation as the matter is before the courts. The 39-year-old suspect is expected to have a bail hearing next week. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Borgette, Ontario. BC's police watchdog is investigating after an officer shot a man who the RCMP says drove into a police detachment parking lot on Vancouver Island and rammed a cruiser. In the aftermath, you can see major damage to the police vehicle. The suspect and the injured Mountie, who was in the cruiser at the time, were both taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. An Idaho mother was found guilty today of killing her children. Murder prosecutors say were driven by extreme religious beliefs. Answer, guilty. A jury convicted Lori Vallow Daybell of murdering her two kids and conspiring to commit murder in the death of her husband's ex-wife. Court heard Vallow Daybell believed her kids were zombies and were possessed by evil spirits. 
Her seven and 16 year old children disappeared in September 2019. Their bodies found nine months later buried in her husband Chad's backyard. He is also charged in connection with the three deaths, but a date for his trial has not yet been set. A U.S. Marine veteran who used a fatal chokehold on an agitated New York City subway passenger has been charged with manslaughter. 24-year-old Daniel Penny is out on bail tonight as he awaits trial. CTV's Los Angeles Bureau Chief Tom Walters has the latest and a warning. Some of these images are difficult to watch. Former Marine Daniel Penny under arrest. Daniel, what do you have to say about the charges? Accused of manslaughter, Penny turned himself into police today. He did so voluntarily and with the sort of dignity and integrity that is characteristic. It's been nearly two weeks since Penny restrained a homeless man who was behaving erratically on a New York subway and kept Jordan Neely in a chokehold until he died. For days, there has been anger at police for not arresting Penny and at prosecutors for not charging him. Charged now, he entered no plea. But to convict Penny of manslaughter, a court would not have to find that he intended to kill Neely, just that he did so recklessly. I believe that at the least, he did not have consideration for his life because he was poor, homeless, and black. Known for performing on the subway, Jordan Neely had a history of mental illness. The day he was killed, police say he did nothing violent or directly threatening, but according to witnesses, he was yelling and asking for money. I don't care if I die, I don't care if I go into jail, um, I don't have any food. Now, whatever happens in court, the killing is already an indictment of public compassion. No one on that train asked Jordan, what's wrong? How can I help you? He was choked to death instead. New York Mayor Eric Adams vows to do better. All of us must work together to do more for our brothers and sisters struggling with serious mental illness. But on that, it seems Adams' own administration could have done more. Jordan Neely was on City Hall's so-called Top 50 list of homeless people most in need of help. Heather? All right, Tom, thank you. The end of a major pandemic immigration policy in the U.S. has led to a surge in migrants at the southern border. Title 42 was a Trump-era policy which allowed officials to turn away asylum seekers on the grounds of preventing the spread of COVID-19. People camped for days waiting for it to be lifted, with an estimated 32,000 migrants entering the U.S. illegally in the last three days. The shelter system in many cities is being strained, with the governor of New York asking for federal help to build more spaces. Washington, though, says the influx has not been as drastic as predicted. The former Prime Minister of Pakistan was released on bail today following an arrest that led to violent protests and rioting. Imran Khan is facing corruption charges in a legal showdown that threatens the stability of the country. CTV's chief international correspondent Paul Workman reports. In the rancorous, inflamed world of Pakistani politics, there was Imran Khan, former Prime Minister, former cricket legend, on his way to a high court ruling that would set him free. Jostled and surrounded by police, winner, for the time being anyway, in a bitter struggle with his political enemies over what he dismisses as bogus accusations of corruption. The military abducted me, he said. They had no reason to arrest me. This is martial law, law of the jungle. Khan's arrest set off rioting across Pakistan until it was ruled illegal by the country's Supreme Court. A number of his supporters were killed, thousands were rounded up and jailed. Today in Lahore, jubilant followers danced in the streets on news of his release. Thank God Imran Khan has got bail, he says. His life is saved. I'm so happy I don't know what to say. Khan turned early cricket fame into eventual election as prime minister. Only to be forced out of office in April last year, he's even accused the military of trying to kill him. Today, arms crossed, making a defiant exit after the high court granted two weeks bail. But with no guarantee, he won't be rearrested as the government has vowed to do.
Pakistan has been thrown into serious turmoil with all of this. Imran Khan warning tonight that if he is arrested a second time, the streets will almost certainly erupt into more violence, Heather. All right, Paul Workman, thank you. Coming up after the break, a ban on barking. A Montreal dog park cracks down on loud canines. Plus, a major drug bust on a submarine. Tonight, dog owners in Montreal say a new rule outlawing barking at a city dog park is going too far. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Jean-Via Beauchemin on the bone of contention. <laughs> For city dogs, this once was a small patch of canine heaven. Sure, it's behind a fence. Still, it's a place in Montreal to run wild and free. But a new sign's gone up. It is uh, prohibited to let our dogs uh, bark, um, howl, or whine. Or else? Fines of 500 to $2,000. How do you stop the dog from barking? Their humans say clearly this neighborhood can't just go to the dogs, but that it's the borough of St. Leonard in Montreal that built this dog park here years ago. This is a place where the dogs are supposed to be free. We're supposed to be able to let them do what they want. Do dog things. Do dog things, exactly. Be dogs. The city points to a long-standing bylaw on the control of domestic animals to reduce, it says, <laughs> the nuisance experienced by the neighborhood. It was the same tale in Toronto earlier this year where bark ban signs went up, but the city walked that back fast. Dog lovers in Montreal say their best friends deserve a bark here and there, too. When I take them to training... Take Hitch, a retired zoo therapy poodle. He's blind in one eye now. Owners worry the canine brigade may be watching, listening, ready to crack down. <coughs> Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Still ahead, $500,000 worth of baby eels seized near Halifax. Poaching arrests and tension over East Coast elver fishing. Colombia's Navy has made a massive drug seizure in the Pacific Ocean, intercepting a sub stuffed with cocaine. Three tons of cocaine valued at over $140 million was found inside. Authorities say drug traffickers were shipping it to Central America. It was the country's largest seizure of its kind on a semi-submersible sub, also called a narco sub, in 30 years. A different kind of illegal business is happening in Maritime Rivers. Poachers are fishing lucrative baby eels known as elvers. And the federal government is accused of not doing enough to stop it. Here, CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief, Chris Anashkate. Three weeks after a 45-day shutdown of the elver fishery was ordered, hundreds of poachers are still fishing illegally in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick's rivers. Just last month, a hydro dam was forced to shut down for more than 20 days after fishermen created a safety risk working too close to the site. This resource is being plundered by unlicensed individuals in an, in, with no control. Licensed elver fisherman Brian Giroux says poachers were out before the season started and accuses the fisheries department of dragging their feet and not doing enough. Elvers or baby eels can sell for up to 5,000 per kilogram. They are then shipped to Asia and grown for food. Illegal fishermen have been overfishing this at-risk species and fighting for territory that quickly turned violent, prompting the halt. Uh, somebody had stolen one of our nets and he went to recover it and they started a beating on his truck with a shovel. So uh, we got out of there quite quickly. The department recently seized $500,000 worth of baby eels a truck, trailer, and more than $15,000 in cash in Enfield. A total of 53 arrests have been made, but still not enough, says this Conservative MP. They've had minor number of arrests versus the thousands of people that are poaching. We need to have an orderly fishery, and that was not happening. Fisheries Minister Joyce Murray admits the issue got out of hand because of how easy it is to fish for elvers. She defends the department, saying they have more than doubled their enforcement resources. 
we will be arresting poachers, we will be confiscating the elvers that they, uh, that they have extracted from the rivers. Fishermen here say unless more regulations are put in place, this tiny species will remain at the center of this large issue on the East Coast. Chris Anachikate, CTV News, Halifax. A giant reptile in Chicago has become the center of attention and garnered an appropriate nickname. Oh my God, that's a massive turtle. Is that a snapper? He's a snapper. That's a, that's a Chicago River snapper. Are you kidding me? Look at that beast. Hey, how you doing, guy? You look good. A couple of kayakers captured these images of a snapping turtle resting on a bed of rusty chains along the Chicago River. They've affectionately called it Chunkosaurus. An environmental group says the turtle is thriving due to efforts to rehabilitate the river, which had been heavily polluted. Still to come, the WNBA heads north of the border. Women's basketball in Canada is getting a big boost this weekend. History will be made tomorrow, and this WNBA game could be the prelude to a team in Toronto. CTV's John Venavelli Rao explains. There's been plenty of hype about Saturday's game, which practically sold out in minutes. And we'll see Chicago's women's NBA team take on Minnesota in front of nearly 20,000 fans at Scotiabank Arena. Would you like to play basketball professionally someday? Yeah. And 11-year-old Kalia thrilled because for the first time she's going to see in person some of the women she looks up to. You get to see like cool players and you learn from them, the moves and stuff like that. And among those at practice today, Ontario's Bridget Carlton, who plays for Minnesota and will become the first Canadian to appear at a WNBA game in her home country. It's pretty surreal. Um, you know, growing up, I never, you know, you never imagined WNBA associated with Canada at all. It's kind of two different things. They said women couldn't come. The Pro Women's League has been around since the 1990s and currently has a dozen teams in the U.S. With this weekend's preseason game, part of a push to expand the WNBA's reach. And this will be just the third time ever that a WNBA game has been played outside of the U.S. Currently, there are four Canadians in the league, and the hope is that'll grow. The Atlanta Dream Select, Letitia Amahir. This Mississauga native, the latest to be drafted. And Toronto-born Natalie Achanwa plays for Minnesota, but is on maternity leave, so won't be on the court tomorrow. Here in Toronto, having a game on home soil, um, these are the things that are going to build the dreams and the goals of the next generation. The league is looking to expand, hoping to add two more teams by 2025. And Toronto is on a narrowed-down list of cities being considered. We know the Canadian national team has had a lot of success um, and so I think hugely uh, popular here and hugely optimistic that, you know, the WNBA is here to stay. With many hoping Saturday is just a preview of more to come. John Benavelli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. That's it for us tonight. I'm Heather Wright for Omar and all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and have a great weekend.